You're listening to the Kelly Green Hour for the Always Next Year Podcast Studio Network. You can find the team on our Twitter, at ANY Podcast, or visit us on our website, www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. And now, to bring us in, the Jack Dolls. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Kelly Green Hour here on the Always Next Year podcast. I'm your host, LJ Harrell, and joining me today is Connor. Connor, how you doing, my friend? Well, we're about five days from OTA, so uh, doing pretty good because the season's feeling real now. Oh, yes, sir, it is. I can't wait. Um, you know, me and you, I, I know you're, a, you're, you're probably a hockey fan first, right? Uh, I'd say yes, but, but barely, just barely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm a, a football guy through and through. Um, I do love you know the Phillies and I do like the Flyers, but but when it comes to the Eagles, no, nobody surpasses the Eagles. Um, we were talking on um, we, I was talking with Shane and Rob on um and Ga- and Kapler we trust, and I was like, when it's football season, I plan everything around the Eagles. You know, whether it's um. Going out with somebody, if, if it's if it's on a Sunday, it can't be 1 o'clock if the Eagles are playing, or 4 o'clock if, if it's a wedding, it better not be on a Sunday. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited, and, you know, th- th- this team has a lot of potential, and that's something that we'll talk about, you know, over the next couple months as we get, get gear up towards training camp and the preseason and the regular season. Um, but this team that Howie Roseman has put together, this team is loaded. And if they can stay healthy, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating and expecting big things. And that's without even looking at a final roster. Absolutely. I, I was kind of putting together a, a depth chart in preparation for, for this. And I was like, it's basically a no brainer. The 53 men I want on the roster There's a couple key battles, but very barely, barely even battles. It's like, is he going to be the three? Is he going to be the four? Is he like, but I mean, the team is unreal. Unreal yeah, but, stat. Definitely. And when you look at it, you know, when, when, what we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about the key position battles. Um, you know, it's really, we know, we pretty much know of the 22 starters, we know like 20 of them. It, it, it for the most part, like 20 are set in stone. Um, you know, there's questions at who's going to be the starting cornerbacks, which we'll get into later. There's questions who's going to start at guard, which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, but other than that, you know, we know who the starting quarterback is. We know who the starting running back is and the backup running back. We know who the, two, the three starting receivers are. Um, so the offense we have at the skill positions, we, we're pretty set. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, we know who our front four is going to be. Uh, we know who two of the linebackers for sure are going to be, which they're pretty much going to play two linebackers the majority of the time anyway. We know who the safeties are. Then we got to talk about the corners. And again, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But you're right, you know, when you look at the names on paper, and obviously they do not play the games on paper, this team has a lot of potential. And it's going to make it, you know, going into 2017, we didn't know, we didn't really know what we had. We kind of thought, okay, they're a playoff team. But then when they made the run with Carson the first 13 games, and then Nick Nick Foles in the playoffs, you know, we were all shocked, but we were pleasantly surprised, obviously, because we got our first Lombardi trophy. You know, this year we're going in with high high anticipation and expectations and and it's going to be key for everybody to, on this on the team to keep a level head and you know don't let allow the outside world to affect their play i agree but it uh, as we know in philadelphia that's not always so easy <laughs> but uh, i i hope this team can do it i mean most of these guys have done it it's just making sure that the newcomers know to just cancel out the noise take on the underdog mentality again whatever you got to do to make it work just cancel out the noise play the game and get the wins yes sir all right so we're going to start with the recent signings let's um it's been a couple weeks um since we've been on and actually the last time me and you got together we both talked about the possibility of bringing in a zach brown type and lo and behold a day later the Eagle signed Zach Brown to a one-year, I think it was $3 million deal. And that's an absolute steal for Howie Roseman. 
Um, mm-hmm. You get him. You put him next to Nigel Bradham and your linebackers, which we we were questioning, um, rightfully so questioning. Now, you know, if Bradham can stay healthy, if Brown comes in and does what we anticipate him doing, you know, that middle of the that middle of the defense at the linebacker position, there's not many question marks there besides the depth behind the two. Agreed, absolutely. I think the signing was awesome. I mean, he graded out as I think the third best linebacker in NF in the NFL. It's an amazing sign. And, and I mean, and then you look at the undrafted free agent, TJ Edwards. Mm-hmm. I'm really high on him. You look at their, I mean, Camus Gruje Hill isn't anything magnificent, but he's a good rotational guy who's going to step in. Nigel Bradham, we know what he can do. We know what he brings to this team. So Zach Brown just solidified that, that linebacker position for us. And Howie Roseman said, don't worry, I hear y'all, and said, all right, time to shut you up. And he made that signing, and it was a steal of a signing. Definitely was. I mean, it was sh- shocking that he was still out there. For somebody who I, I can't remember the exact amount of time. I think it's the last three years, maybe four years, he has the second most tackles in the NFL, only behind Bobby Wagner. So you know, this is somebody that goes sideline to sideline, can cover to, cover tight ends, uh, rush the quarterback, uh, make tackle in the, tackles in the open field. And, you know, we, we saw it when he was with the Washington Redskins. And, you know, two times a year he, he was uh, causing issues for our offense because he's such an aggressive player. Um, you know, him and Lane Johnson actually had a had a had a, a thing going just because Zach Brown was on the Redskins and uh, playing defense. And with Johnson playing right tackle for the Eagles, you know, they, they went up against each other a lot in the two times a year that the, the Redskins and Eagles met up. But, you know, as soon as the signing was made, Johnson put a tweet out squashing their, squashing their beef. And then um, Zach Brown kind of retweeted and, and said, yep, we're here for one common goal. We're going to win a championship. Go to win a championship. And that's what you love to see, you know, the, the the current players embracing the new players and the new players embracing what we're, that what Doug Peterson is building here in Philadelphia. Absolutely. That, that's, you hit it right on the head there. Zach Brown, like putting that aside and just saying we're here for a championship – you know this team has the right mentality going forward. You know that they're all going to work together, and they want that championship. You could come from – they could pick up all the free agents from within the division, and they'd all say, screw whatever happened in the past. We're, we're winning a championship this year. Yeah, I mean, we saw it when DeMarco Murray signed here. Granted, it wasn't the greatest – I know it's not the greatest example, but you know he was with the Dallas Cowboys before signing with the Eagles and you know spending his one year here. Um, Dallas kind of did what they wanted to do with him. They um, rode him, rode him, and rode him, and then he wasn't the same after that. Um, but, you know, when he came here, he was excited to play with Sam Bradford, excited to play in the offense under Chip Kelly. And you're right. When division – except Brent Selleck, because Brent Selleck had an offer to play with the Cowboys uh, last year, and he opted to retire as an Eagle because he said he couldn't put that star on, which I'm so glad he didn't because – you so know, much respect for that. Exactly. You know, besides Brian Dawkins, who I think should have retired, should have retired playing with just the Eagles. He should have never went to Denver. And we all know that, you know, Joe Banner and, and, and company, they, they admitted to screwing that up. Um, but, you know, if there was somebody that should have played their entire career in Midnight Green, you know, Brent Selleck's that person. Brandon Graham has a chance to do it. Fletcher Cox probably has a chance to do it. So I, I'm glad. And, and like you mentioned it, respect for um, Brent Selleck, you know, opting to retire and not go after cash and playing for the enemy. Exactly. All right. So we talked about Zach Brown. Let's talk about Stefan Wisniewski. When he got cut, I don't think uh, many people anticipated him making his way back to Philadelphia. There were a bunch of teams out there that, that he had a chance to go and, and probably be a starter. You know, maybe the New York Jets um, as an example, because their offensive line isn't, isn't great, but he was out there, couldn't find anything he liked, and opted to come back to Philadelphia. And another, you know, great pickup by Howie Roseman because we know that the guard position is a little iffy. Brandon um, Brandon Brooks with his Achilles injury, Sayamalu probably playing left guard, but Sayamalu and Wisniewski the last couple of years kind of went back and forth. This was a really good signing a depth piece along the offensive line and one that is going to be key because the Eagles, if, if they're old anywhere, it's on that offensive line minus Lane Johnson and now um, Dillard, but he's going to be a key. He, he's probably going to be a starter week one. 
Uh, definitely will be because of the Brooks injury. He, he definitely will step in as a starter. And that, I think, is exactly why the signing was made and done, was because we can bring in all these pieces, but we know Wisniewski is proven. And we know that he's going to do his job. And you put him in with Kelsey and Peters and Johnson, and I, I have all the faith in him that he's going to do just fine. You take him and you put him on a team that has issues along the offensive line. I don't think he's a fix, but you put him in there for six to eight weeks or however long we may be without Brooks and he's going to do just a fine job. And if Brooks needs some time and they need to sub in and out a bit when Brooks first comes back, you know, you have, you can have faith in Wisniewski to do that. And he came on a killer contract too. I think it was 1.5 million or something like that. So you can't complain with the, the, the dollar figure because that's an awesome depth piece. Who's just going to support an injury right now. Definitely. And I, actually thought he was better than Sayamalu when given the chance to play the last couple of years. Um, somebody who I think, you know, he was better in, in, in run blocking and pass protecting, but obviously Sayamalu is, is their draft pick. So they wanted to give him the opportunity to play and see what they have in him. But like you mentioned, this depth piece, he's going to come in, he's going to offer the ability for Brooks, not to rush back. You know, even though Brooks is talking about, you know, he'll be ready week one, which if he's ready week one, that's that's amazing. Um, in my eyes, I, I don't see it happening. Um, but there is no need for him to rush back. He can take his time, make sure his injury is healed 100% correctly and healthy. Because you know we saw Jason Peters, was it five years ago, six years ago, whatever it was? He tore his, eight, tore his Achilles during the, during the season. And then he tore it in the offseason again. So you don't want to rush. You, you don't want to be playing around with it. And, and you want to make sure that it's, to the to the to the ability that you're going to be able to feel comfortable on it because being an offensive lineman you're going to be pushing off of that when you have to run block and you're going to be having you know guys weighing 300 350 pounds you know coming at you and that could also put some pressure on it so we want him because he's one of the best right guards in football I don't care what anybody says um and and the Saints game changed when he went out the Eagles weren't able to do anything offensively and that was because he wasn't there and he is a really key part to that offensive line he is absolutely. He is a massive piece to that line. I mean, you think of Lane Johnson, you think of Jason Kelsey, Jason Peters, and then you look at, and then you have Brandon Brooks. That was a scary line. And it was only whenever there was injuries or whenever they had to sub out for any reason that you noticed issues in the line. Those four were key cogs and, and it doesn't change this year. But I like you said, and I agree, we're not going to rush him back for that. I mean, I've been following him a bit on Twitter and seeing his recovery sounds like it's going amazing. But I mean, take your time. Don't re injure yourself and make sure you're a hundred percent. When you come back, this isn't like losing Wentz at this point where our backup Sudfeld, you have a, a strong backup in Wisniewski who's going to do the job for you and he's going to do a great job. So take your time, get it right and help us with the playoff run. Yes, sir. Definitely agree. And then, um, an under the radar one. Well, it's not really under radar in Philly because the Eagles are the, are the number one team. But the Eagles signed Cody Kessler, who used to be a, a part of the Jacksonville Jaguars, went to USC at college, and then they released Luis Perez, um, who they had signed from the Birmingham Ham Iron of the AAF. Um, now bringing in, bringing in Kessler, a gives them another arm, somebody that you know if if Wentz isn't ready to begin throwing the football or not ready for when OTA start. Um, you have him, you have Sudfeld, uh, you have Clayton Thorson. Do you think that Kessler actually has a chance of making the team or is this just a camp arm, somebody to, to come in to throw the ball until Carson Wentz gets hundred percent healthy? I think that Kessler is someone who's just there to create competition for Sudfeld and Thorson. I actually put him, pegged him on my depth chart as making it because I think they can move Thorson to the practice squad without having to worry because based on everything I've seen in videos, uh, highlights of him and stuff, Thorson is no really great quarterback by any stretch of the imagination. I think he barely is a number three quarterback, if that. Kessler brings you someone who has experience in the NFL who can kind of help on the sideline. He's no Nick Foles by any stretch. He's no Sam Bradford. He's not someone who's going to bring you a lot. But I think he's there just to kind of make it so that Sudfeld and Thorson aren't comfortable and say, 
Sudfeld says, I'm, oh, I'm not number two and I'm fine. And, and Thorson says, oh, I'm number three and I'm a lock on the roster. I think he's there to make them a little uncomfortable and to give them that competition in camp. But I wouldn't be surprised to see him make the roster. Do you think the Eagles are going to actually carry three quarterbacks? Um, I Based on Carson Wentz's history, I, I have it on my death chart that they do. The spot that I question if they carry three is actually at tight end if they actually are going to carry three on at the tight end position. But I do think that they will carry the three quarterbacks just based on Carson Wentz's back and that he's not 100% yet and we're head entering into OTAs, still not 100% for sure. So I know I think the Eagles are learning from last year's mistake and having him rush back. I actually think that Wentz is ready to go, but they don't want to they, – they made the mistake last year of putting a timeline on Carson Wentz, and when they didn't hit the timeline, everybody freaked out. So I think the Eagles are actually playing it smart this year by saying, look, he'll be ready when he's ready. You know, we're not going to we're not going to put him in a bind. We're not going to put him in um in a, um you know, put a timeline on him so that if they say, yeah, he'll be ready by July, you know, July 20th. And by July 20th, he's not out on the field. And then fans are freaking out like, oh, my God, Carson Wentz is injury prone. So I, I do think that by the time training camp comes, he's going to be fine. I think they're only going to care. I think there's more chance of carrying two quarterbacks and three tight ends than the vice versa. We know it's going to be Zach Gertz and Dallas Goddard. And I think they really do like um, Richard Rogers and re-signing him, bringing him back. So I think they're going to carry three tight ends because they do like, you know, to go three tight ends every once in a while. And it's, and one of them can also play the, the H back fullback type of role. Um, you know, you can put Goddard back there, put Richard Rogers back there. Um, but if they are, fully confident in Carson Wentz being healthy. I could see the Eagles carrying Wentz, carrying Sudfeld, and I don't see any other team picking up Cody Kessler. So if something were to happen, like for unfortunately to happen, they could just call up Cody Kessler and be like, hey, dude, come come back. We need you on the roster and go from there. Um, but that's how I see it. I know that's one of the disagreements me and you have. Yeah, I think that like you just, it's it's all about what they think Wentz's health is like and where the comfort is with Wentz as to whether or not they're going to end up carrying three or not um I mean like you said no one's going to go back out and pick up Kessler and I don't think anyone's going to go and get Thorson if you put him on the practice squad I think it would take some major major injury issues along someone's quarterback position to to go find Thorson on the Eagles practice squad um but Kessler yeah I don't see him going anywhere else he's not a great backup he's not a great starter he's not even a great third string quarterback so I mean I don't think we have anything to worry about in that position either yeah I agree um were there any other signings or anybody else that you wanted to speak on before we move to the next um the the next subject just because I I thought those three were kind of the big three um at least recently was there anybody else that you wanted to speak on no I think those were the big three that that got uh, Eagles Twitter up in uh, Roar, so I think we hit on him. Okay, all right. So I want to move on to let's go to NFL news. The Jets fired their general manager Mike McCagnin and vice president of player personnel Brian Heim- Heimerdinger. And as soon as that happened, there was talk. Which before before we get to the talk of Joe Douglas during the draft, uh, my cousin's a big Jets fan, and and we were talking about there was there was all the rumors that. Adam Gase and Mike McCagnin were not getting along and that as soon as the draft was over, which makes zero sense to me. Why would you wait till the till after the draft to fire a general manager? Cause then he could kind of sabotage the draft if he really wanted to. Um, but you know, I kind of anticipated this happening. I'm surprised it took what, a month later for it, for it to happen. But were you surprised at the move of the jets firing their GM and VP of player personnel? Honestly, not not really. The, the timing definitely because it just made no sense, like you said, to, to fire him right after you went through the main process that the general manager has to do. You went out and you let him spend money on Mosley. You would have said, let him spend money on Bell. And then you let him go through the whole draft process. And then you decide, oh, he's done a bad job. Let's fire him. It it just makes no sense to me why you do that. And then Adam Gaze coming out saying he didn't want to sign Le'Veon Bell. He thought we were, they were spending too much money. That just is a sign of a completely dysfunctional head office and a disconnect between 
the people who are actually coaching and on field level and the people who are watching from the press box. And it's just not not a good situation for the Jets to be in, not a good situation for any team to be in, to have such a disconnect where your coach is saying, not liking the player decisions you make, and they think they're making the right decisions up top. You know, when the Jets fired Todd Bowles and they made this hire, I was shocked because I don't think Adam Gase is that great of a coach. Uh, I'm glad, you know, the Eagles got fortunate because there were reports back when the Eagles hired Chip, or excuse me, when they hired um, Doug Peterson, that Adam Gase and, you know, Ben McAdoo were, were at the top of the list. And we got really fortunate that the Eagles didn't hire either of the two. Um, and, and the Jets seeing the Dolphins twice a year the last three years and seeing Adam Gase, you know, Adam Gase had issues with Jay Ajayi. They gave him to, to the Eagles for nothing. And the Eagles won a Super Bowl, um, you know, and, you know, as you mentioned, he was mad at the front office for all the money they gave Le'Veon Bell, CJ Mosley. You know, I have no idea what the Jets saw in Adam Gase. Adam Gase is a good offensive coordinator. A lot of that, though, has to do with he had Peyton Manning as his quarterback. Peyton Manning was running his own offense. Let's be let's be real here. So I was shocked that Adam Gase got another head coaching job right away. I agree. I I, never, I didn't like the hiring from the beginning, and then he just adds to it by just throwing his head office under the bus, not working with them, not basically saying, I don't understand why you did this. I don't understand why you did that. And I mean, you never want to see that. You would you would you would assume that Doug Peterson is never going to say that about Howie Roseman or, or Joe Douglas. You would assume that that isn't going to happen. And you would assume that in any, in, in amongst any team, you would think that you can settle it inside behind closed doors, figure it out, understand why you're doing this and why you're doing that. But at the same time, maybe that's just how much of a disconnect gaze has from just the league in general to think that you're going to get away with, one of the best linebackers and one of the best running backs and say, I think we paid too much. I think that's, that's just crazy to think about that. You're going to sit there and complain about getting two of the best at those positions because of the dollar figure. That's just how this league is. Look at the quarterbacks they are getting $35 million a year. Now we're working towards our first $40 million a year quarterback. It's, it's a game where the cap continues to go up which means the price you pay for players continues to go up as well. And I think Adam Gaze, it's just the disconnect that he has with just the the league in general. He gets the game of football, but the league and the way that business runs in the league, I just, I don't think he has any right to be commenting. I, I agree with you 100%. Now let's move back to this situation. Uh, they have interest in Joe Douglas. Um, Joe Douglas now, he pro- I, I'm pretty sure he puts the draft board together. Um, he, he, he hires the scouts. He does all this. But it's Howie Roseman's team. It's his show when it comes to the draft time. And we know that Joe Douglas wants to run his own team. Um, I don't know if he wants to go to this dysfunctional team that the Jets have. Um, but it's an opportunity to become a general manager in the National Football League. A, should Joe Douglas take it if, if offered? And B, should the Eagles do everything in their power to keep Joe Douglas in Philadelphia? Like you said, it's Howie Roseman's football team at the end of the day. And I think that Howie could find a replacement who who can do the job he wants them to do and work with them just as closely as him and Joe Douglas have. I have no concerns with Howie or whoever hires a replacement. I'm sure Howie would have quite the hand in that. But Whatever they were able to hire, I think Howie would know who he wants, what he wants them to bring to the team, etc. Should he take the job? If the rumors are true about them going out after Daniel Jeremiah and stuff, then they're kind of building the, in the right direction as far as a front office, as far as a general manager and a director of player personnel go. So I'm not... I, if, if, if things go just him going there... And then you hire your own staff and figure it out from there. I don't know if I'd take that position if I was him because you just never know what's going to happen once you go over there. You don't know what you're getting into with Adam Gaze. You don't know what you're getting into with ownership. But if they start setting the framework for you and they get a Daniel Jeremiah and they start setting the framework and you go over and then you bring some of your own scouts potentially, then it's not necessarily such a bad position for him to be in. 
but on the surface, I would say absolutely not. Um, but if is there any concern about if he leaves us figuring things out? I don't think so. Do you think the last three draft classes since uh, Joe Douglas has been here and working with um, Howie Roseman, do you, do you have any concerns with the type of players they bring in? Because I, I do feel like that Joe Douglas has has a, has a big say in who the Eagles have been drafting over the, over the last couple of years, and you know we saw how what how Howie Roseman did before you know before Chip Kelly, uh, even with Chip Kelly, you know he's the one that claims that he draft uh, Marcus Smith. Um, and we talked about the, the 2014 I think draft class, which wasn't good. Um, are we more concerned? I'm trying to figure out how to – because I think that Joe Douglas – I think the Eagles need to give him the general manager role. And when they give him the general manager role, if they give him the general manager role, let him be the general manager. Let him run the football operations. Um, you know, let Howie run – handle the cap situation um, and, and whatnot. But I think Joe Douglas deserves the opportunity here um, to be the, the go-to guy, to be the man to make the picks, sign the players, um, or pick the players to sign – and get and given that opportunity otherwise i think he's gone if not this year to the jets he'll definitely be gone within the next year or two yeah i agree i think eventually the time's going to come where he goes if we don't give him what he wants i mean i think this the the eagles are one of those teams that they're just so quiet you just see how he doing how he things and making these amazing these magical cap things happen and then the drafting is just done so well we're getting such great pieces i mean look at the undrafted uh the undrafted free agent class it's been praised heavily for what some of the pieces we got in that udfa class so it's like who's making these decisions who's making these calls who has more of a hand in it it's it's we're a team that's so quiet about what happens behind the scenes in regards to who makes the decisions that it's tough to tell, but I, I wouldn't be against giving Douglas what he wants. If he wants a general manager role and how he's okay with doing his, his magic with the contracts, and I would say, yes, absolutely do it. I mean, we just don't want to create a friction between the two when they have such an amazing working relationship and building this Super Bowl team and this very much potentially Super Bowl contending team again this year. You don't want to create that friction, but at the same time, you don't want someone to go on a power trip like Howie Roseman and say, no, this is my team, and I don't want Joe Douglas to be the general manager. I don't want to make him get him more power and make him more calls. So it's it's a really tough call to do, but if we don't give Joe Douglas a higher-up position and move him around and give him more power, I think eventually, obviously, he's going to go, and he's going to build a team, and he's going to go off and be like a Howie Roseman somewhere else whether it be this year with the Jets or whether it be in the coming years when another executive gets that go. Yeah. And, you know, Joe Douglas and Andy Weidel, when they brought them in, they, you know, that they were great um, pieces to bring in to help Howie Roseman and to help build this team. And it resulted in a Super Bowl. So we'll see. We'll see where the Eagles decide to go and where and what Joe Douglas decides to do. We know he wants to run his own team. Obviously, you know, if, if, if you're going up the ladder in front office, the ultimate – dream is to to be a general manager to be able to run a team so it, it, we'll, we'll see what happens and you know hopefully joe hopefully the eagles do joe right and I, I would love to see him stay in philly but he also deserves a chance to uh run his own team all right so let's move towards um this was going around twitter um we're going to talk about the eagles obviously we're going to go over these categories most overrated most underrated the best player the key new addition could surprise who's going to take a leap and who is in for a prove it year. And I'm hoping that this creates some dialogue between us. Hopefully we have a bunch of different or a couple of different answers. Um, you know, we, we seem to agree a lot. Um, and I'm, so I'm hoping that this is something that we'll have difference of opinions and we'll be able to, to get a good conversation. So let's start with most overrated. Who do you have? So for most overrated for me, I have Nelson Aguilar. And I, in large part, have put Nelson Aguilar because when people were talking about on Twitter about picking up his $9 million contract, people were going on about how what would we do without Aguilar? What are we going to do? How do we do this? I think we have to remember that 
just a mere couple of years ago, Nelson Aguilar was a guy who couldn't even catch a football. So to think that we couldn't replace him with somebody else, I find is is a rather outlandish thought. I think he's replaceable. I think the $9 million was excessive for a slot receiver like Aguilar, who's just finally getting his game going. Um, so my overrated was Nelson Aguilar. I have Aguilar at a different position. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, my most overrated, I actually put Ronald Darby. Um, when he's healthy, or when he even when he was healthy, yeah, he was our best corner, but that really didn't say much because our corners really weren't that good. They, they really surprised when, when he got hurt, when Mills got hurt, and the younger guys had to come in, LeBlanc and Maddox. Um, when they all had to, had to play, you know, they stepped up. But, but what does Ronald Darby really have? Um, he's he, he he's got speed, but he doesn't really know how to use it all that well. Um, he just like Jalen Mills, you know, he bites on double moves. Um, he seems to be out of position a lot. Um, I hope that Ronald Darby comes back 100%, takes over the number one cornerback spot, and, and becomes a force in stopping, you know, the Amari Coopers. Um, but as of right now, um, you know, we, we traded Jordan Matthews for him, so like we didn't lose anything um, when we made that initial trade. But I'm saying Darby is a little overrated, or the most overrated on the team right now. Mm. I, I, I can definitely see where you're coming from there. I think it it would be a whole different ball game if the guy didn't go down with an injury every Two years season. in a row. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The two years he's been with the Eagles. All right, let's move to most underrated. Who do you got? I got Malcolm Jenkins. I find Malcolm Jenkins is like the Claude Giroux of the Eagles. I mean, we quite often say, oh, look, he played all these snaps, but whoa, we whoa, don't. Whoa, 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 whoa. He's better than Claude Giroux. But continue. <laughs> I think I'm, I'm not saying in terms of better or worse. I'm saying in terms of uh, more or less the fact that they're underrated and on a similar okay. level. But I mean, I he, Malcolm Jenkins, he, he plays like we sit there and we're like, oh, he played 100 percent of snaps. But all too often, that's all we stop at. Not what he truly brings, the leadership that he brings. If someone bites on a fake like Jalen Mills, who's the guy to bail him out? Malcolm Jenkins is there to help him out. And he's all over the field. He's that type of player that we just often take for granted. And I think people are starting to realize we take it for granted because suddenly everyone's like, oh, my God, he didn't show up for voluntary workouts. And they think he's he's going to hold out on us now, which I don't think is true. But that's who I put as underrated. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. Are you concerned that he hasn't been at these these voluntary, and I'm going to say voluntary with emphasis because it is voluntary uh, workouts? Do you think it has anything to do with his contract? Do you just think that he's trying to get himself his body right and he'll be in when it when it becomes mandatory? I definitely think he'll be there when it becomes mandatory. I think it's about getting his body right. But at the same time, it's probably putting a scare into the Eagles to say, I'm not afraid to do this if I don't get what I deserve. I mean, he's a he's a top safety, and he is definitely not getting paid like one at this very moment in comparison to some of the other safeties. But I think he, it's it's a mix of both. But it's not like when mandatory comes, he's not going to show up. He, I think he'll show up when the mandatory time comes. And he's just getting his body right. I mean, like we just said, the man played 100% of defensive snaps last season. If there's anyone who deserves to skip a voluntary workout, should it not be Malcolm Jenkins? I, I agree with you. Uh, my, I actually put two names down, and Malcolm was one of them, so I won't go with him. And usually I don't think a, a second-year player – can be underrated, but I'm saying Avante Maddox. Avante Maddox was the savior in the secondary last year. He played safety after never playing safety. He played slot corner and he played outside corner, covering the likes of DeAndre Hopkins and did it pretty dang well. Um, so I know he's only coming into his second year and it's tough to, to say that somebody is underrated, but when you look at all, all that he did for the Eagles last year, you know, with his size and, and being a rookie and not playing the safety position and playing inside, playing outside, he never complained. He put his hat on, you know, he went to work, did his job and, and, and you know, did it pretty satisfactory, in my opinion. So I'm going with Avante Maddox as uh, the most underrated. Definitely makes sense there. Like, for me, I can't put underrated as a rookie or a second year guy. I feel like we got you got to look a bit further and and see 
like more like four or five years. But I get where you're coming from with Avante Maddox. I think he was definitely underappreciated for all the work that he put in. Like you said, he just put his helmet on every day. He said, where do you want me? And he went out there and he played it. And I think he's definitely someone who's going to take a big step forward this year, especially in a cornerback room that's going to create a ton of competition. Yep. All right. So best player, I'm pretty sure we're probably going to go with the same player. Who you got for best player? I got Zach Ertz. Oh, we don't have I know some pe- a lot of people at Fletcher Cox, but I think we have to look. And, and I mean, maybe I just want it to be different. But <laughs> Zach Ertz is, is so important to that offense. I think you see it. When we couldn't get the ball to Zach Ertz, our offense was almost useless, almost basically stagnant. So he's so important to have on the field, and he's so important for opening up the field for other people like Alshon Jeffrey, for Deshaun Jackson. This year, I mean, this year he might go a little overshadowed because there's just so many weapons that you can't just say Zach Ertz was the creator of that space, although he definitely can open up the middle of the field for people making coming inside on slants and stuff. So I took Zach Ertz. Uh, I went with Fletcher Cox. Um, when Fletcher Cox is not out there on the defensive line, teams just run right up the middle on us. Now, it might be different this year because we get it, we have a Malik Jackson and hopefully a healthy and happy um, Timmy Jernigan. And then we have two stout linebackers now. Um, but, you know, the defensive line is really different when – Fletcher Cox is not on the field. And this is somebody, you know, two years ago, he, he played 60-ish percent of the snaps. Last year, he was up to around eight in the 80 percentage uh, range for snaps. So I'm glad that they have depth now. Um, he won't have to be on the field, you know, for, for long periods of time. But you can see the difference in the defensive line for the Eagles and the defense for the Eagles when he is not on the field. He is by far their best defensive player and I think their best overall player. Yeah, it's so important that he gets that time throughout the season so that you can put him out there for 95% of the snaps during the regular season. It showed during that that Super Bowl run, and even the, the commentators made reference to it, that given make, doing 75 80% of snaps throughout the year just gave Fletcher Cox that ability to really play like 95% of the snaps during the postseason and it just showed how important he was to be out there all that time during the postseason for us because he clogs that lane. He bring, draws the double teams. He draws the attention and opens up the edge for guys like Brandon Graham and Chris Long and, and Derek Barnett to actually get to the quarterback and make a play. Yeah, and when they go up against the likes of the Rams and Aaron Donald's on the other side or the Texans and J.J. Watts on the other side and all these players that – everybody says are the best defensive players in the league. He steps his game up. You know, he dominated that Rams game. He had a great game against the Texans. You know, when, when other players are being talked about as the best defensive players, he wants to go out there and prove that, you know, he shouldn't be looked over. He's a player that should be talked about as the top tier defensive player in the NFL. Agreed. All right. So key new addition, who you got? I got Zach Brown. I scoured through the UDFAs and the, the, the draft picks that we had, and I just can't find anyone who's going to impact the team like Zach Brown's going to impact the team this year. He's going to be so important for helping Nigel Bradham. We've all too often leaned on Nigel Bradham, who is not the type of guy who you should lean on for 100% of your linebacker duties. So Zach Brown is going to be huge. I think that the play in the middle of that field and on potential blitz plays when Schwartz uses blitz plays, which is very rarely, I think Zach Brand will be huge and people will see that in, in the support he'll give Nigel Bradham. Yeah, he's definitely going to be a key uh, addition. I went with Deshaun Jackson. He's going to open up the field for Zach Ertz even more, uh, for Alshon, uh, even for Nelson, and for the running backs, you know, and Dallas Goddard. He, he's going to – just his speed alone – you know, he, he may be 31, 32, but we saw it last year, first play of the game, he, he went 80 yards, you know, right past Jalen Mills and right past Malcolm Jenkins, who admitted that he bit up for some reason, even though everybody knew what the first play of the game was going to be. Um, but I think Deshaun Jackson, he's coming in with a mission, A, to prove that he should have never left Philadelphia, and B, to be like, to, to prove that the Eagles didn't make a mistake by bringing him back. And I think it's going – I wore my Deshaun Jackson jersey to work today because I was so excited – for the Eagles, I'm excited that he's back in town, um, and I think he's going to have a big year for us. 
Um, he's going to help. He might not get the, the, the eight, nine, ten catches a game, but he's going to have a one big pass play. Um, he's going to open up the middle of the field for somebody. Um, and if him and Carson Wentz can get on the same track, uh, get on the same page, excuse me, and Wentz is able to hit that deep, deep bomb to him, you know, bombs away, you know, anything is going to be possible for this Eagles offense. Absolutely. And like I said about Zach Ertz, like Zach Ertz used to be the one to open up the field. I think, like you said, Deshaun Jackson, like I would hate to be a defensive coordinator preparing for an Eagles game and saying, all right, we can't double anybody. So everyone has to stick like glue to the man that you're on. Because if we double somebody, somebody's getting open down the field. Somebody's getting open in the middle of the field. Somebody's just getting open in general. There's just so many weapons. It's unreal. I can't wait. And let's talk about the red zone real quick. You have Alshon, you have Zach Ertz, you have Dallas Goddard, you have J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. Like, they're all, what, 6'3", six, 6'4"? Six, they're, they're all over 6'3", to my knowledge. So, so, like, good luck trying to to, to, to stop. If, if Wentz is able to throw a jump ball, a fade, anything like that, good luck stopping the Eagles' offense in the red zone. Oh, right. I agree. Like, imagine having a Jalen Mills trying to get all over that. There's going to be... I think we're going to get might set a record for most uh, pass interference calls in a red zone with that type of red zone offense. <laughs> it, it's going to, it's going to be fun to watch. Um, now the player that could surprise who you got. We're definitely going to be on <laughs> complete different sides of the spectrum here, I think. And Shane, Shane will laugh at me for this, but I think the could surprise is Rasul Douglas. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the picture of him, but he has lost his baby fat. He has been going to the gym and working out hard this offseason, and I think he's going to come and he's going to surprise. Pro Football Focus ranked him as our top cornerback last year at an 80% rating, which is definitely not that bad because I know you're going to sit there and say it couldn't. It doesn't take much to be the best cornerback on that roster. But he was with an 80 rating and above average rating, and I think he's going to step up, and I think he's going to surprise this year. I actually, we're getting into it later, but I think he's going to be in the starters of the cornerbacks. I think he needs to move to safety. I'm still of that. Um, unless his, his speed improves, he's always around the football. Um, that's one thing about Russell Douglas is, is when, whenever there's a football thrown in his vicinity, he's there. Um, and But I still think – he should move to safety. My good surprise is Nelson Aguilar. <laughs> um, I think with the addition of Deshaun Jackson, mm. he's going to go back to the slot where he is a slot receiver. You don't have Jordan. You do notice. So two, two years ago, um, when Jordan Matthews was not here, Nelson Aguilar had a really good year. Three years ago when Nelson Agu- or when Jordan Matthews was here, Nelson Aguilar couldn't catch a lick. Last year when Jordan Matthews got here, Nelson Aguilar kind of became lost. I really do think there's something to that when, when Jordan Matthews is around, Nelson Aguilar forgets how to play football. Um, I don't think that's really true. But still, th- th- there's something to that. I, mean, I would I, hope not. I you, really, I, you really I, don't have to worry about Jordan Matthews. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, but I think that with Nelson Aguilar being put back to the slot, he doesn't have to play outside. He won't be taking those, you know – bubble screens and, and having eight catches for 28 yards in a game, which was so frustrating when that happened in the first half of last year. Um, he, he was like catching the ball a lot, but his average yards per catch was like five yards and it was frustrating. Um, but I think Nelson Aguilar has a chance to really break out this year. And he really, for his own sake, he really needs to, because he's probably not going to be with the Eagles after this year. And if he wants to get that big contract, he needs to have a huge year. And whether, whoever it's with, they're going to want to see him make plays and we, we, we saw it, you know, he had a big catch against the Texans last year. Uh, two years ago, had that big catch against the Arizona Cardinals. He has that ability. Now I think he'll, fi- I'm hoping, and I think he'll finally harness it, bring it all together, and he's going to show why he was a first-round draft pick. I, I, I kind of agree. I mean, I hope he proves me wrong for putting him in the overrated slot because so many people were so worried when we were going to potentially walk away from him at $9 million. So all I got to say is I hope he proves me wrong for what I put him at as overrated and he proves that he's worth $9 million in an offense that if you were someone who you're kind of getting lost in the the, the jumble of players, this, they are going to open up that field for Nelson Aguilar because people are going to look for Deshaun Jackson, Alshon Jeffrey, and Zach Ertz. So it is a perfect time for him to prove himself. Yep. All right, uh, we have two categories left. Who is the player that will take a leap this year? 
My take a leap, and I've I've been a big fan since we drafted him, Derek Barnett. I think that this year is going to be, if he can stay 100% healthy, I think it's going to be a passing of the torch. Brandon Graham just recently signed a new contract, but obviously we know he's on the wrong side of 30 years old. And I think it's going to begin to be a passing of the torch for Graham to Barnett as Derek Barnett takes over as the number one edge rusher in the coming couple of years. It's just fully dependent on him being healthy, which I hope so, because as we all know, Derek Barnett is part of the infamous play that we all know from the from the Super, uh, Bowl. Super Bowl, the strip sack where Derek Barnett picked it up uh, from the after the hit. So I hope that he comes out and he proves this and he starts to take the torch from Graham and become a, becomes the number one edge rusher. We drafted him to be in that first round. Yep, you took the words right out of my mouth. He was my per, uh, player that takes the leap. I put Derek Barnett down. Uh, he needs to stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, we know he has the ability. You know, he broke Reggie White's sack record at Tennessee in college. Um, he had the big fumble recovery in the Super Bowl. Had the big sack against the Colts last year um, when the Colts were driving down on fourth down, was able to trip up Andrew Luck, um, which resulted in a turnover on downs and helping the Eagles come away with the victory in Carson Wentz's first start last year. Um, and, you know, he's the future at the defensive end position for the Eagles. Um, he needs to prove it. Um and, you know, I think he's going to have a big year. He comes back healthy. He's going to be a starter. It's going to be him. It's going to be uh, Brandon Graham. And, you know, they're going to – all eyes are going to be on him because, you know, the Eagles are going to – or opposing offensive lines are going to double-team Fletcher Cox. And they're going to, you know, slide men towards Brandon Graham and Mal, uh, Malik Jackson. It's going to be up to Derek Burnett to get to the quarterback. Absolutely, and that's exactly my thoughts. With all the depth along that defensive line – the attention is going to be inside at double teaming and stopping the likes of Jackson and Cox. So it's a perfect time for Burnett to make something happen. And what better year to do it? All right. And last but not least, who's who has to prove it this year? There's been so many. I've seen so many of these on Twitter and there's so many prove it people. And I didn't realize it until now, but mine is Sidney Jones. Me and Shane talked about it on Crossing Borders last night. Sidney Jones has got to prove it. It that that cornerback room is getting extremely competitive, and you can tell like the like we talked about Maddox, we talked about Douglas Darby. It we talked about it on Crossing Borders is just like he can't continue to step in as that last guy every year. Like Darby's might leave next year. Oh, I'm going to just make the roster because of that. He can't continue to go on with that type of mentality not saying he has that type of mentality but he's got to to get comfortable with his ankle he's got to be prepared to go out he's got to be able to make those cuts he's got to be able to just play as the corner the potential first round top 10 pick that we picked him as in the second round we picked him as a steal he's got to prove it he's got to step up he's got to get comfortable in the position and come back from that injury these injuries once and for all Oh, that's funny because I put Sidney Jones down too. Um, pretty much for everything you said. Um, I was a huge Sidney Jones fan coming out of college at Washington. And then when he tore his Achilles um, during his pro day, I was upset because I thought the Eagles were going to take him at number 14 that year. And when they got him in the second round, I said they got a first round talent in the second round. You know, the first year is going to be a wash. He wasn't going to play. And last year was going to be a he needs to come out and he needs to prove that they didn't waste a pick on him and he kept getting hurt. It just seems like every he, he's got, I don't want to say weak bones, but it was just a lot of joint injuries. It seemed like his ankle was twisted, um, twisting on him. And every time he were to make a move, make a cut, it felt like something was going wrong with him. Um, but you're right. You know, he needs to prove that a, he can stay healthy and B that he is going to be that talent that we anticipate him being because, you know, you mentioned it. Ronald Darby on a one-year deal. Jalen Mills on the last year. His contract. You know, Sidney Jones. One thing for him, though, when he, he's not a slot corner. So the Eagle, he was at a disadvantage when the Eagles put him there last year. Um, if given the opportunity and put on the outside, I think he can su- succeed. So it, it will be interesting to see, you know, what Jim Schwartz and Corey Unlin and what they decide to do uh, with the cornerback position. And again, we'll talk about that uh, later. But you know, it, 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 this is a key year for him because if he doesn't prove that he can stay healthy, if he doesn't prove that, 
you know, he has what it takes to be a starting caliber NFL quarterback or cornerback, excuse me. Um, you know, he, he's only going to last this one, con- one, one contract here and he'll be elsewhere. And he could just be somebody that floats around the league. Yeah. Contrary to a lot of people's beliefs, that cornerback room is, is deep and it's getting really competitive. And I, I laugh at the people who thought we should have drafted a cornerback because we already have six. How are you going to make the decision to, if you drafted one to go from seven to six? You're not going to carry seven cornerbacks. It's already pretty wild to think that we're going to carry six. So, Yeah, so um, that was actually a good exercise there. I, I like that. Hopefully we find some more uh, different categories like that that we can go over um, in the coming months uh, as we hit, get – get steamrolling towards uh, training camp. Now let's talk about the key position battles. Uh, we won't go over all of them. The Eagles have, you know, six of them. I, I think in my opinion, um, let's start. We, we, we talked about the offensive line already because it was new So we can skip that. Uh, let's talk about defensive end. Um, we know that Derek Barnett and Brandon Graham are your starters. We don't think Chris Long is coming back. So they need depth. They, they re-signed or they brought back Vinnie Curry. Um, they drafted Sharif Miller. They're high on Joe Osman. They drafted Josh Sweat last year. What do you think is going to happen with the backup defensive ends for the Philadelphia Eagles? Well, the six names you said are the six I have on my depth chart. I don't think it's a very competitive room as far as that goes. Uh, definitely Graham and Barnett to start. Curry's just a specialist. He, he'll come in. He he can flex in there when Barnett or Graham need a few snaps off or if they go down with a, a cramp muscle or something. I, I'm pretty high on Josh Sweat. I think he still has a real chance to prove it with us. And he he, had, he, sh- he showed flashes, and I think he just needs to become consistent as a rotational player. He, the, he has the benefit of being a rotational player, so it's a good opportunity for him to really prove it this year as that fourth or fifth guy. Um Sharif Miller, I don't know where he lands. I put him at five, and then I also took Joe Osman because I know where I know we're high on him. And I, I, in looking at scouting reports and watching videos from him in college, he he's a he he's a beast. He has a lot of potential. He just as a rotational end, he might provide just that boost we need. But um, it's it's not a very competitive room. I mean, as far as the depth goes, I think it's just rotating the guys as need be. Rotate Curry and Graham, rotate Sweat and Barnett, rotate when they need a rest, rotate Miller in there. Kind of just just have a strong rotation with Graham and Barnett covering 50% on each side. So Yeah, so it shouldn't be shocking that the Eagles are going to keep about 10 defensive linemen and probably around 8 to 9 offensive linemen. Just because, again, we talked about how they, they like to build from the inside out. And if you're strong on the lines, then you're going to have a strong football team. So that makes sense. Um, we'll do one other defensive position. Let's go to linebacker because we know it's Nigel Bradham and and Zach Brown. Um, probably Kamugu J. Hill if they go to three linebackers. But we're both high on TJ Edwards. They brought in Paul Warlow last year, but then he got hurt. They signed LJ Fort in the offseason, and they have Nate Jerry, who I want to see off the face of this planet, or at least out of an Eagles uniform. Um, beyond those, the first three, is it going to be Edwards and Fort? Is, are you going to keep three extra with uh, Warlow? What do you think the birds are going to do? I had us take him five and I had us keep him Fort and Edwards. I mean, in, in watching Edwards, Edwards football IQ isn't great. He's very impulsive and likes to go for the ball. So that's good to keep him as a fifth linebacker option. He'll come out, he'll get you some tackles. Hopefully he's not targeted on a play because he probably will give up the big play. But as far as the others go, yeah, I have Brown, Bradham, Grugier, Hill, Fort, and Edwards. Fort was a great linebacker. He actually ranked in the top 20 probably as a surprise to most people um, because he's generally a special teams guy. But it just goes to show that as a rotational linebacker, he's going to do the job for us. I have us just moving on from Warlu and saying goodbye to Nate Geary as well because I would be happy to see him go. We gave him the chance that we moved him from safety to linebacker because we knew he wasn't meant to be at safety, and he just isn't meant to be at linebacker. I don't think he's meant to be on a football team in general. 100% agreed. Uh, you can ask Shane. My, every time I saw him on the field, I flipped out because I couldn't stand seeing him out there. So let's go to the offensive side of the ball. I want to go to running backs. Uh, we know that Josh – uh, Jordan Howard, excuse me, and 
Miles Sanders are your one and two in any order. It's probably Sanders is probably going to get the bulk of the carries by the end of the year. I think he's that good and has a chance if he doesn't hit a rookie wall um, to be in the rookie offensive rookie of the year ca- um, conversation um, at, at the running back position. Um, now the question will be, will the Eagles carry three running backs or will they carry four? Um, if they carry three, it probably will be Corey Clement. But then you have that outside question of, is Darren Sproles going to come back? Cause obviously they love Darren Sproles. We all love Darren Sproles. He's just getting up there in age. Um, you know, when he, when he was out for those, what, eight, nine weeks. And then he came back, they, that first half of the game, his first game back, they kept giving him the ball, which was surprising. Um, do you, who do you think is going to you know, be the third, possibly fourth running back? We have Josh Adams, Corey Clement, Donnell Pumphrey, Wendell Smallwood. Uh, where do you think the, the Eagles go? I have us keeping four running backs. My thoughts on Donnell Pumphrey are the same as they are on Nate Geary. I think it's time to give up on him. It's time to let him go. He's not the Darren Sproles-like player that we expected him to be. I think we move on from him. Josh Adams just proved not consistent enough to keep on the roster, so I have him going as well. Um, I have Howard, Clement, Sanders, and Smallwood. But Smallwood is certainly flexible if Sproles comes back, because I would take Sproles over Smallwood any day. Man, but Small- I was going with four running backs just based on Corey Clement's uh, history of injuries and stuff. It doesn't hurt to have that fourth running back if you have the space on the 53-man roster to do it. It's crazy that Smallwood just finds a way to stay on this roster. Um, he's not the greatest running back. He, you know, he's not the greatest pass protector, even though he he got a little better last year. Um, but you know, it, when they give him the ball, he gets yards. <laughs> um, shockingly, that's so, all we ask for is a, is a fourth running back. That's all. If you can take the ball, if you can catch a ball, and you can get us 50, 60 yards out of the backfield, it just alleviates pressure off of Carson Wentz. Yeah. Um, so. Obviously behind the two, I think the, the three are 99.9% set in stone. You know, it's going to be Howard. It's going to be Sanders. And I think Clement, um, that fourth one, I think it really does depend on Darren Sproles. You know, he's somebody that just doesn't doesn't want to put himself through camp anymore, which, you know, he's up there. He's, what, 34 now, 33. Um, so I'm not surprised there. So if the Eagles are willing to let him come back at, towards the back end of the preseason and training camp, maybe he decides to come back and – you know, he's, he's the Mighty Mouse still has the still has, uh, I think, something left in those legs. Yeah, as much as I'd love to see Sproles come back, I've basically planned to not have Sproles in long back because you look at the depth chart and it's still an incredible depth chart with or without them. What they bring, I'm sure somebody else on the depth chart can bring a similar aspect to the game. Yep. All right. And then one more offensive position. Um I'm going to go with wide receiver. We know who the top three are, Alshon, Deshaun, and Nelson Aguilar. Beyond that, the Eagles like typically like to keep five. So we have Matt Collins, Shelton Gibson, Braxton Miller, Greg Ward, Charles Johnson, um, and J.J. Arcega-Whiteside. He's on it. So there's your four. We know the four. I, I can't believe I blanked on um, J.J. Um, so I apologize, uh, J.J., if you're listening. Um, so we have Jeffrey, Jackson, Aguilar, and Arcega-Whiteside. Probably one more out of that group of five that I mentioned, maybe two more at the very most. Um, who do you think they are? You know, have they has does you know, Matt Collins who didn't play at all last year? Is he going to be able to do enough? We we know he's a great special teams player, um, and the Eagles value special teams. Shelton Gibson just can't get on the field, even though he has the speed. They like Braxton Miller a lot. Um, they they signed him to be on the practice squad last year from from the Texans. Um, so. It, do they give him the opportunity? You know, Greg Ward's been – Greg Ward and Charles Johnson were in the AAF. Greg Ward's been on the practice squad before. Uh, what do you think the Birds decide to do at the wide receiver position? Me and uh, Shane briefly touched on, like, the Mac Holland situation the other night, and I, I kind of agree with it that who who is Mac Collins? What do we have in Mac Collins is a big question because we haven't really seen him truly be able to show us who he is and what he is and what he's going to bring to the game. So – I think Matt Collins comes in as a fifth receiver. Um, Personally, I mean, Ward, like we said, he's jumped between practice squads in the AF. Johnson intrigues me because he's a burner. He's a fast guy. So, I mean, he's kind of like your Deshaun Jackson-esque player. Um, But I think it's going to be Matt Collins that gets that fifth spot because, really, we haven't seen a whole lot out of him. And I don't know if the injury was truly 
I just think they didn't have the space on the roster to bring him in. And they just put him as this injured guy in the background that everyone kind of forgot about. And now we're coming back into training camp and OTAs, and it's like, oh, shit, Matt Collins is coming back. So, I mean, my, my big – I think it's going to be big. Training camp will be huge. Somebody's really, really got to prove it in training camp and in the preseason. But I still think Matt Collins comes out on top. So you think they only keep five? Yeah, I think they only keep five. Okay. I mean, I I, I think they might go out to sixth possibly. Um, and I think that, that sixth could go to Braxton Miller. Um, but we'll see. I mean, and they also – Brought in DeAndre Tompkins, who's a, who's a speedster from Penn State. Um, so uh, again, they brought in like four too many Penn State guys this all season. Um, but I think it, this all this training camp um, OTA, it's going to be fun. There's so there's a lot of depth. This is a very talented team. We know the first 40 to 45, like we know for sure who's going to be on the team. The back, you know, the back half of the roster, back 10 of the roster. It's going to be a fun battle because there's a lot, like you mentioned, the cornerback room. There's a lot of guys there, a lot of talent. Who's going to? They just got to battle it out. The wide receiver room, the running back room, the, the offensive line room, defensive line room. It's just going to be fun to, to watch and see how how things play out. Now I have a question for you. Go ahead. We we kind of avoided the uh, the the offensive line room because we assume it's it's pretty easy to pick. But when I was putting together my depth chart, is it time to give up on Jordan Maylada? I know that when we drafted Andre Dillard, there was a lot of talk on sports radio. Like, I listened to Satellite Radio, so I listened to Mad Dog and ESPN, Stephen A., all that. And and they actually brought up the Jordan Maylotta experiment, and how we've tried to keep him on the team, and we've tried to make him into a football player, more or less. Do you think it's time to give up on Jordan Maylotta and move on with the pick of Andre Dillard? Well, I don't think it's time to move, that, move on yet, but... I want to see how he does in preseason. You know, last preseason for somebody who had never put on a helmet or shoulder pads, he didn't look all that bad. Now he has that year of, you know, of, of, of practice with NFL players or practicing in the NFL game. Um, you know, it's unfortunate. He's too big to be a guard because you can move him in, inside the guard. Just imagine that him and Dillard, him and Peters and then him and Dillard. I think that, I mean, that could possibly be a monster um, left side of the line, but I think, it's tough. I don't, I don't, I don't see him being a left tackle now because it's going to be Dillard. Dillard is your future left tackle. Um, and Johnson is the right tackle. So the question does become, like you mentioned, where do you put Jordan Mailata? Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a tough question. I don't think they're going to give up on him. You know, yes, he was a seventh round draft pick, but the Eagles typically like to give their draft picks a chance. So, you know, if, if you think about it, it's going to be Peters, Say Amalu, Kelsey, Brooks, and Johnson. Say they're your five starters. Wisniewski's mm-hmm. going to make the team. Uh, Pryor's going to make the team. And Vitae Vi- Vi- might make the team. That's it it's, right there. It's actually surprising because I actually put Vitae and Melada as possible cuts. I actually am quite high on Ryan Bates, and I think that they yeah. might end up taking Ryan Bates because Ryan Bates has experience at tackle but not the size. And he played left tackle and right tackle. So if we can make get that transition for Ryan Bates into guard, he could be good at left guard. He could be good at right guard. He has that flexibility that we wish Maylotta could have, but Maylotta just has too much size to be able move to be able moved into the line. Yeah, and and I heard an a interview Ryan Bates gave, and he said he chose the Eagles pretty much because of the lack of depth here on the offensive line. Like the starters are, we have really good starters along the offensive line, but behind them we have. You know, we have issues with depth, and that's one of the mm-hmm. reasons why why he picked. And, and again, that's where the credit goes to Howie Roseman and Joe Douglas. You know, they went out and scoured the the, the undrafted free agent market, and they brought in some some players. You know, you think about Corey Clement two years ago, Josh Adams last year, you know, TJ Edwards and Ryan Bates this year could be guys that make the team as undrafted free agents, you know. And it's very rare when you see that happen for three, four, five years in a row, but the Eagles have had success at that. And – it's important because, you know, you're about to give your starting quarterback a humongous contract. So you want to be able to have guys that can play and play on cheap salaries. Agreed. I, I mean, I was moving on from Vitae and Melotta. It, just like you with Gary, 
Vitae, whenever someone went down and he was a replacement, I almost had to rip my hair out because I find Vitae extremely frustrating to watch on a football field. He just doesn't even grasp the basics of being on an offensive line. And you put him in covering the blind side and taking over Lane or covering Lane Johnson's side. And it's like, it's so frustrating because he just gives up so many sacks and he allows so much pressure on the quarterback. And I think it's just, I, I know that we, I think we recently gave him an extension, but I think it just might be time to move on and give up on Vitae. And, and it's a shame, too, because the Super Bowl year when he, he replaced Jason Peters, he was really good. Um, you know, we didn't really we didn't talk about him, which when you're not talking about an offensive lineman, that means they're not making mistakes. Um, and, you know, when he came out after the Patriots preseason game last year, it was like, yeah, you know, we won the Super Bowl last year. So I didn't really train more or less didn't really train in the offseason. That was a killer for him. So, you know, we'll see. Hopefully he has a different mindset and he's able to turn you know able to to turn our heads and 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 turn the fans heads and 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 show that the eagles you know have something with him in terms of being a versatile you know a a guy that can be um looked upon to be a backup on both left tackle and right tackle Mm -hmm. i agree all right so let's go to our mailbag uh, as we're finishing up the kelly green hour here Uh, again i'm your host lg hero and he's connor up in old canada how's the weather up there by the way we're, we're coming along i mean I, I mean scary enough it actually just over the weekend it uh, the rain was so cold that it turned to snow and it's may so you know that's kind of crazy but uh, it's, it's getting a bit better the sun's shining so step in the right direction i wish we had snow it hits the 80 degree mark here and i'm i'm ready to melt okay um we have a couple questions. First, from Silence Do Good at Matt underscore Graph underscore. Who are the starting quarterbacks week one? And barring no injuries, do they keep their jobs throughout the season? Yeah, the big question is barring injuries because that cornerback room is injury prone as can be. Mm-hmm. But uh, I I put uh, I go Ronald Darby on the outside. Obviously, you gave him the money. I have Craven LeBlanc in the slot because I think he comes back same same as he was through the playoffs for us. And the last outside spot was a toss-up for me. And I put, mostly because he was on my list as someone who was going to take a step forward, I put Rasul Douglas. I think seeing what I saw, like the picture and, and what I saw from him being the cornerback last year, one of the best cornerbacks on, on our team, I think he's going to come back and he's going to really show up this year and take a spot on the outside. Now, are we going into the season healthy at the cornerback position? Or are we going with the injuries that Darby let's, and Bell have? Assume, let's assume healthy. Okay. Um, my slot corner is Avante Maddox. Uh, he, I, I just, you, you can't keep him off the field at, at this rate. Unless he has a, a sophomore slump, I, I think Avante Maddox has got to be on the field. Um, and I think they're going to start with Darby and Mills on the outside. But, you know, Jones is going to be ready to step in. Uh, Douglas is going to be ready to step in. LeBlanc, uh, you know, he, it's, I, I think it's going to be tough for him to make the team, unfortunately, but it also depends on, again, barring injuries. Um, but I, I do think that they're going to go with the the two starters from, from last year. You know, again, if they are healthy coming into the season, they're, they're the two that are going to start. And then Avante Maddox will be at the slot. And I think it's going to end up changing up throughout the season just because, you know, I don't – Mills was a seventh-round pick, and he was a seventh-round pick for a reason. And we, we see the deficiencies that both of Darby and Mills have. So we're going to see a lot of different guys back there, and uh, hopefully somebody's just able to stick it, uh, stick with it and become the uh, be a starter and somebody that can be not, you know, a Dion or Sante Samuel lockdown type of corner – but somebody that's able to make plays and keep receivers, you know, from catching three touchdowns every week. Yeah, I, I felt the same way. I, I think it's going to change around. I mean, maybe for the first couple weeks it might be a lock, but I don't think – it's tough to say that that who our starting cornerbacks are going to be from week to week. Whoever performs it is going to be – they're going to flex in and out, and they're going to move around. It's going to be like a defensive line, basically. Uh, but in the cornerback room because there's five or six at least that are going to be there. 
Well, I mean, when it comes to start, I mean, the cornerbacks are the most flexible. We know who the four starters are along the defensive line, and then we got the depth behind them. Uh, but when it comes to the starters, they, you just pick draw names out of a hat, and that's pretty much who's probably going to start from week to week. Um, and the final question: There's a report out that Carson Wentz is going to receive a thirty million dollar per year contract before the season starts. Your thoughts on it? Should they wait? Is it the right time to do it? Is thirty million the right amount? Um, and it, it pretty much, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And should the Eagles do it? I think the Eagles got to do it. Thirty million dollars, I think, is a steal for the franchise quarterback that you have. If he comes back and has that MVP caliber season like he had in 2017 before he went down with the injury, I mean, you could be looking at paying this guy. This could be the first $40 million a year quarterback. You got to pay them before you got to pay him before golf and Prescott get their money because then he's going to compare himself to them. If Prescott goes down and gets 32 million, do you think for two seconds Carson Wentz is accepting $30 million? Absolutely not because he knows he's better than Dak Prescott. We know he's better than Dak Prescott. If Jared Goff goes out and get and gets 35 million, are we going to be able to get him at $30 million? Absolutely not. He's going to say, I'm better than Goff. We know he's better than Goff. Let's just look at last year's Super Bowl, for example. We know what he's worth. We know he could easily be that $40 million quarterback. All it takes is one season of letting him just go out and do his thing and not sign this extension. I think we have to do it. $30 million is a good price. You're just slightly higher than the likes of Derek Carr. You're in the same price range as a Matt Stafford. I think that's a comfortable spot for him, and I think we have to do it, and we deal with the consequences down the road if he ends up having more injury issues. But it would be a steal to get him at $30 million right now. Yeah, I agree with you. They need to get the contract taken care of now because you know, if he has another 2017-type season this year, again, he, you're right. He could be the first $40 million a year quarterback. Um, you know, you, you want to get him signed before Prescott, before Goff, before Mahomes, um, you know, before Hopkins, before uh, – or not Hopkins, um, before Watson, before all these young guys get these bloated contracts. Do we think – again, you mentioned it. Do we think Dak Prescott is worth $32 million a year? Heck no, but it's the quarterback position. Um, if, if you're, and it's Jerry Jones. And, and, Jerry and, Jones so think that man's probably worth $50 million a year. When, when we watch the Dallas Cowboys play, we know that Zeke Elliott is the one that is carrying that team. Give – Give Carson Wentz a Zeke Elliott, and the Eagles don't lose games. Um, you know, the, the Eagles would have uh, – Carson Wentz would have taken Dallas the, the, the rookie year. Carson Wentz would have taken Dallas to the Super Bowl that year, uh, the year they went 13-3 and lost to Aaron Rodgers in the divisional round. Um, thank you, Aaron Rodgers, by the way. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah, you, you want to get this contract done, taken care of as soon as possible because you're, this is the cheapest that you're going to get him at. Um you know, you could risk it and wait, and but but that means you're hoping, and you're you know even though you're not saying it, you're kind of wishing and hoping that your quarterback kind of has a down year, and you don't want that for your franchise quarterback. So give him the thirty million dollars now, and deal with the consequences later in terms of you know if he's going to want a bigger payday or if he's going to want a renewed contract in three years, we'll deal with it then. But get him a, a thirty million dollar a year contract now, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and you know, they have the money under the cap right now, so might as well take care of it. And this is where, you know, Joe Douglas and Howie Roseman have done a great job. I mentioned it before the undrafted free agent market, you know, they, they have to hit on these draft picks, these draft picks that they brought in this year. And in the last couple of years, they have to be players because you're going to have to get rid of maybe Alshon next year. That's where JC, JJ, our Segi Whiteside, um, is going to step in. You might have to get rid of Malcolm Jenkins because his contract is going to be bloated. Um, Jordan, who knows if they're going to bring Jordan Howard back after this year. So Miles Sanders has to step in. Um, so it, it's going to be very, very important for the Eagles to hit on the draft picks, hit on the undrafted free agent market um, and signing players like a Zach Brown for only $3 million. It's very important for them to hit on these guys when you're going to be paying your quarterback 30 to $35 million a year. Absolutely. We're, 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 we were so privileged to have done all we did under his rookie contract. And now, the rookie contract's over. We're one of those teams that no longer can we enjoy the luxury of having our rook, our our franchise quarterback on a rookie contract. And honestly, even if you're wishing bad so that we can get a cheaper contract from Wentz this year, those weapons are so much better. Leaps and bounds better than 2017. 
it will take an injury for him not to have another MVP caliber season with those weapons this year. So we got to get that locked down now. I agree 100%. Uh, so before we finish off, Connor, what are your final thoughts um, on upcoming OTAs, which start in, what, five days, something like that, a week? Um, and, you know, as we progress towards training camp in the preseason. I'm, I'm pumped. I am excited. I think we have a complete team. I think we have a better team than the year we won the Super Bowl. I think it's just on paper we see it this way because if all these guys pan out, we do have an all-around amazing team. And I'm just really excited. I can't wait for OTAs to get going. And I'm just crossing my fingers and praying for no injuries every night. I do that because I we can't have injuries. We can't have it like last year. If we had a healthy secondary, could we have made it past New Orleans? I have no doubt we would have made it past New Orleans. The amount of times I ripped a hair out for those third and longs that they gave up last year, during that game, so I'm I'm excited. I'm pumped. Not, that, that those are my thoughts. Not seeing that stick defense. If I don't ever see that again, it'll be too soon. Um, <laughs> all, you know, it didn't even take that. It took Brandon. If Brandon Brooks stays healthy, the Eagles win that game. You know, they they couldn't run the ball after he left. So again, it, it all comes down to health. What's your Twitter and where people can follow you, Connor? You can find me at Connor Ten. That's T E N, not the number. And I'm at L J Harrell fifty four. And then you can follow the Always Next Year podcast, Twitter at ANY Podcast. Also subscribe to our website at www.alwaysnextyearpodcast.com. Be on the lookout. We have uh, some giveaways we'll be doing. We got starting to get in the merchandise, shirts, mugs, uh, phone covers, keychains, stuff like that. Um, so be on the lookout um, for that as and we'll get them out. You know, we're going to start – we're really going to get this thing going, especially with football season coming up, uh, the, the big time. Uh, Connor and I, we're going to – go soon uh probably when training camp starts and if definitely when preseason starts uh we'll be doing the kelly green hour weekly which is going to be great i can talk football all day every day absolutely all right uh, we want to also thank the jack dolls they've uh provided the intro and outro music for the kelly green hour for connor i'm lj thank you for listening to the kelly green hour here on the always next year podcast This has been a production of the Always Next Year Podcast Network. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, Spreaker, and SoundCloud. Please also remember to rate and review this podcast to validate our members' life choices. We appreciate it. This is AMYP, signing off.